story four of a changed man and other tales by thomas hardy this librivox recording is in the public domain story four the grave by the hand post i never pass through chalk newton without turning to regard the neighbouring upland at a point where a lane crosses the lone straight highway dividing this from the next parish a sight which does not fail to recall the event that once happened there and though it may seem superfluous at this date to disinter more memories of village history the whispers of that spot may claim to be preserved it was on a dark yet mild and exceptionally dry evening at christmas time according to the testimony of william dewey of melstock michael mail and others that the choir of chalk newton a large parish situate about halfway between the towns of ival and casterbridge and now a railway station left their homes just before midnight to repeat their annual harmonies under the windows of the local population the band of instrumentalists and singers was one of the largest in the county and unlike the smaller and finer melstock string band which eschewed all but the catgut it included brass and reed performers at full sunday services and reached all across the west gallery on this night there were two or three violins two cellos a tenor viol double bass hoboy clarinets serpent and seven singers it was however not the choir's labours but what its members chanced to witness that particularly marked the occasion they had pursued their rounds for many years without meeting with any incident of an unusual kind but to-night according to the assertions of several there prevailed to begin with an exceptionally solemn and thoughtful mood among two or three of the oldest in the band as if they were thinking they might be joined by the phantoms of dead friends who had been of their number in earlier years and now were mute in the churchyard under flattening mounds friends who had shown greater zeal for melody in their time than was shown in this or that some past voice of a semi-transparent figure might quaver from some bedroom window its acknowledgment of their nocturnal greeting instead of a familiar living neighbour whether this were fact or fancy the younger members of the choir met together with their customary thoughtlessness and buoyancy when they had gathered by the stone stump of the cross in the middle of the village near the white horse inn which they made their starting point some one observed that they were full early that it was not yet twelve o'clock the local waits of those days mostly refrained from sounding a note before christmas morning had astronomically arrived and not caring to return to their beer they decided to begin with some outlying cottages in sidlinch lane where the people had no clocks and would not know whether it were night or morning in that direction they accordingly went and as they ascended to higher ground their attention was attracted by a light beyond the houses quite at the top of the lane the road from chalk newton to broad sidlish is about two miles long and in the middle of its course where it passes over the ridge dividing the two villages it crosses at right angles as has been stated the lonely monotonous old highway known as long ash lane which runs straight as a surveyor's line many miles north and south of this spot on the foundation of a roman road and has often been mentioned in these narratives though now quite deserted and grass-grown at the beginning of the century it was well kept and frequented by traffic the glimmering light appeared to come from the precise point where the roads intersected i think i know what that med mean one of the group remarked they stood a few moments discussing the probability of the light having origin in an event of which rumours had reached them and resolved to go up the hill approaching the highland their conjectures were strengthened long ash lane cut athwart them right and left and they saw that at the junction of the four ways under the hand-post a grave was dug into which as the choir drew nigh a corpse had just been thrown by the four sidlinch men employed for the purpose 
the cart and horse which had brought the body thither stood silently by the singers and musicians from chalk newton halted and looked on while the gravediggers shovelled in and trod down the earth till the hole being filled the latter threw their spades into the cart and prepared to depart who mid ye be a barian there asked lot sonhills in a raised voice not the sergeant the sidlinch men had been so deeply engrossed in their task that they had not noticed the lanterns of the chalk newton choir till now what be ye the newton carol singers returned the representatives of sidlinch ay sure can it be that it is old sergeant hallway you've a buried there tis so you've heard about it then the choir knew no particulars only that he had shot himself in his apple closet on the previous sunday nobody seems to know what i done it for i believe leastwise we don't know at chalk newton continued lot oh yes it all came out at the inquest the singers drew close and the sidlinch men pausing to rest after their labours told the story it was all owing to that son of his poor old man it broke his heart but the son is a soldier surely now with his regiment in the east indies ay and it have been rough with the army over there lately twas a pity his father persuaded him to go but luke shouldn't a twinted the sergeant on it since a did it for the best the circumstances in brief were these the sergeant who had come to this lamentable end father of the young soldier who had gone with his regiment to the east had been singularly comfortable in his military experiences these having ended long before the outbreak of the great war with france on his discharge after duly serving his time he had returned to his native village and married and taken kindly to domestic life but the war in which england next involved herself had cost him many frettings that age and infirmity prevented him from being ever again an active unit of the army when his only son grew to young manhood and the question arose of his going out in life the lad expressed his wish to be a mechanic but his father advised enthusiastically for the army trade is coming to nothing in these days he said and if the war with the french lasts as it will trade will be still worse the army luke that's a thing for ye twas the makin o me and twill be the makin o you i hadn't half such a chance as you'll have in these splendid hotter times luke demurred for he was a home-keeping peace-loving youth but putting respectful trust in his father's judgment he at length gave way and enlisted in the blank foot in the course of a few weeks he was sent out to india to his regiment which had distinguished itself in the east under general wellesley but luke was unlucky news came home indirectly that he lay sick out there and then on one recent day when his father was out walking the old man had received tidings that a letter awaited him at casterbridge the sergeant sent a special messenger the whole nine miles and the letter was paid for and brought home but though as he had guessed it came from luke its contents were of an unexpected tenor the letter had been written during a time of deep depression luke said that his life was a burden and a slavery and bitterly reproached his father for advising him to embark on a career for which he felt unsuited he found himself suffering fatigues and illnesses without gaining glory and engaged in a cause which he did not understand or appreciate if it had not been for his father's bad advice he luke would now have been working comfortably at a trade in the village that he had never wished to leave after reading the letter the sergeant advanced a few steps till he was quite out of sight of everybody and then sat down on the bank by the wayside when he arose half an hour later he looked withered and broken and from that day his natural spirits left him wounded to the quick by his son's sarcastic stings he indulged in liquor more and more frequently his wife had died some years before this date and the sergeant lived alone in the house which had been hers one morning in the december under notice the report of a gun had been heard on his premises 
and on entering the neighbors found him in a dying state he had shot himself with an old firelock that he used for scaring birds and from what he had said the day before and the arrangements he had made for his decease there was no doubt that his end had been deliberately planned as a consequence of the despondency into which he had been thrown by his son's letter the coroner's jury returned a verdict of fellow de se here's his son's letter said one of the sidlinch men twas found in his father's pocket you can see by the state on it how many times he read it o'er howsomever the lord's will be done since it must whether or no the grave was filled up and levelled no mound being shaped over it the sidlinch men then bade the chalk newton choir good night and departed with the cart in which they had brought the sergeant's body to the hill when their tread had died away from the ear and the wind swept over the isolated grave with its customary syphil of indifference lot swanhills turned and spoke to old richard toller the hallboy player tis hard upon a man and he a walled soldier to serve and so richard not that the sergeant was ever in a battle bigger than would go into a half-acre paddock that's true still his soul ought to have as good a chance as another man's all the same eh richard replied that he was quite of the same opinion what do you say to liftin up a carol over his grave as tis christmas and no hurry to begin down in parish and twouldn't take up ten minutes and not a soul up here to say us nay or know anything about it lot nodded assent the man ought to ha his chances he repeated ye may as well sped upon his grave for all the good we shall do him by what we lift up now he's gone so far said notton the clarinet man and professed sceptic of the choir but i'm agreed if the rest be they thereupon placed themselves in a semicircle by the newly stirred earth and roused the dull air with the well-known number sixteen of their collection which lot gave out as being the one he thought best suited to the occasion and the mood he comes the prisoners to release in satan's bondage held janet we've never played to a dead man afore said ezra castock when having concluded the last verse they stood reflecting for a breath or two but it do seem more merciful than to go away and leave em as they t'other fellows have done now back along to newton and by the time we get over right the parsons twill be half after twelve said the leader they had not however done more than gather up their instruments when the wind brought to their notice the noise of a vehicle rapidly driven up the same lane from sidlinch which the gravediggers had lately retraced to avoid being run over when moving on they waited till the benighted traveller whoever he might be should pass them where they stood in the wider area of the cross in half a minute the light of the lanterns fell upon a hired fly drawn by a steaming and jaded horse it reached the hand-post where a voice from the inside cried stop here the driver pulled rein the carriage door was opened from within and there leapt out a private soldier in the uniform of some line regiment he looked around and was apparently surprised to see the musicians standing there have you buried a man here he asked no we bant sidlich folk thank god we be newton choir though a man is just buried here that's true and we've raised a carol over the poor mortal's anatomy what do my eyes see before me young luke holway that went with his regiment to the east indies or do i see a spirit straight from the battlefield be the son that wrote the letter don't don't, don't ask me the funeral is over then there were no funeral in a christian manner of speaking but it's buried sure enough you must have met the men going back in the empty cart like a dog in a ditch and all through me he remained silent looking at the grave and they could not help pitying him my friends he said i understand better now you have i suppose in neighbourly charity sung peace to his soul i thank you from my heart for your kind pity yes i am sergeant holway's miserable son i'm the son who has brought about his father's death as truly as if i had done it with my own hand 
oh no no don't take ye on so young man he'd been naturally low for a good while off and on so we hear we were out in the east when i wrote to him everything had seemed to go wrong with me just after my letter had gone we were ordered home that's how it is you see me here as soon as we got into barracks at casterbridge i heard of this damn me i'll dare to follow my father and make away with myself too it is the only thing left to do now don't you be rash luke hallway i say again but try to make amends by your future life and maybe your father will smile a smile down from heaven upon ye for it he shook his head i don't know about that he answered bitterly try and be worthy of your father at his best tis not too late do you think not i fancy it is well i'll turn it over thank you for your good counsel i'll live for one thing at any rate i'll move father's body to a decent christian churchyard if i do it with my own hands i can't save his life but i can give him an honourable grave he shan't lie in this accursed place ah as our parson says tis a barbarous custom they keep up at sidlinch and ought to be done away with the man a old soldier too you see our parson is not like yours at sidlinch he says it is barbarous does he so it is cried the soldier now hearken my friends then he proceeded to inquire if they would increase his indebtedness to them by undertaking the removal privately of the body of the suicide to the churchyard not of sidlinch a parish he now hated but of chalk newton he would give them all he possessed to do it lot asked ezra catstock what he thought of it catstock the cello player who was also the sexton demurred and advised the young soldier to sound the rector about it first mid be he would object and yet a mightn't the parson of sidlinch is a hard man i own he and a set of folk will kill themselves in hot blood they must take the consequences but oz don't think like that at all and might allow it what's his name the honourable and reverend mr oldham brother to lord wessex but you needn't be afeard on that account he'll talk to ye like a common man if so be ye haven't had enough drink to give ye bad breath ah oh, the same as formerly i'll ask him thank you and that duty done what then there's a war in spain i hear our next move is there i'll try to show myself to be what my father wished me i don't suppose i shall but i'll try in my feeble way that much i swear here over his body so help me god luke smacked his palm against the white hand-post with such force that it shook yes there's war in spain and another chance for me to be worthy of father so the matter ended that night that the private acted in one thing as he had vowed to do soon became apparent for during the christmas week the rector came into the churchyard when catstock was there and asked him to find a spot that would be suitable for the purpose of such an interment adding that he had slightly known the late sergeant and was not aware of any law which forbade him to assent to the removal the letter of the rule having been observed but as he did not wish to seem moved by opposition to his neighbour at sidlinch he had stipulated that the act of charity should be carried out at night and as privately as possible and that the grave should be in an obscure part of the enclosure you'd better see the young man about it at once added the rector but before ezra had done anything luke came down to his house his furlough had been cut short owing to new developments of the war in the peninsula and being obliged to go back to his regiment immediately he was compelled to leave the exhumation and reinterment to his friends everything was paid for and he implored them all to see it carried out forthwith with this the soldier left the next day ezra on thinking the matter over again went across to the rectory struck with sudden misgivings he had remembered that the sergeant had been buried without a coffin and he was not sure that a stake had not been driven through him the business would be more troublesome than they had at first supposed 
Hmm, yes, indeed, murmured the rector. I am afraid it is not feasible after all. The next event was the arrival of a headstone by carrier from the nearest town, to be left at Mr. Ezra Catstock's, all expenses paid. The sexton and the carrier deposited the stone in the former's outhouse, and Ezra, left alone, put on his spectacles, and read the brief and simple inscription. Here lieth the body of Samuel Holway, late sergeant in His Majesty's blank regiment of foot, who departed this life December the twentieth, eighteen o blank, erected by L. H. I am not worthy to be called thy son. Ezra again called at the Riverside Rectory. The stone is come, sir, but I'm afeard we can't do it no how. I should like to oblige him, said the gentlemanly old incumbent, and I would forego all fees willingly. Still, if you and the others don't think you can carry it out, I am in doubt what to say. Well, sir, I've made inquiry of a Sidlinch woman as to his burial, and what I thought seems true. They buried him with a new six-foot hurdle saw, Drove's body, from the sheep pen up in North Uslitch, though they don't own to it now, and the question is, is the moving worth while, considering the awkwardness? Have you heard anything more of the young man? Ezra had only heard that he had embarked that week for Spain with the rest of the regiment, and if he's as desperate as it seemed, we shall never see him here in England again. It is an awkward case, said the rector. Ezra talked it over with the choir one of whom suggested that the stone might be erected at the crossroads. This was regarded as impractical. Another said that it might be set up in the churchyard without removing the body, but this was seen to be dishonest. So nothing was done. The headstone remained in Ezra's outhouse till, growing tired of seeing it there, he put it away among the bushes at the bottom of his garden. The subject was sometimes revived among them, but it always ended with, "'Considering I was buried, we can hardly make a jaw on it.' There was always the consciousness that Luke would never come back, an impression strengthened by the disasters which were rumoured to have befallen the army in Spain. This tended to make their inertness permanent. The headstone grew green as it lay on its back under Ezra's bushes, then a tree by the river was blown down, and, falling across the stone, cracked it in three pieces. Ultimately, the pieces became buried in the leaves and mould. Luke had not been born a Chalk Newton man, and he had no relations left in Sidlinch, so that no tidings of him reached either village throughout the war. But after Waterloo and the fall of Napoleon, there arrived at Sidlinch one day an English sergeant-major, covered with stripes and, as it turned out, rich in glory. Foreign service had so totally changed Luke Hallway that it was not until he told his name that the inhabitants recognized him as the sergeant's only son. He had served with unswerving effectiveness through the peninsular campaigns under Wellington, had fought at Busaco, Fuentes de Norre, Ciudad Rodrigo, Badejos, Salamanca, Vitoria, Catrabra, and Waterloo, and had now returned to enjoy a more than earned pension and repose in his native district. He hardly stayed in Sidlinch longer than to take a meal on his arrival. The same evening he started on foot over the hill to Chalk Newton, passing the hand-post, and saying, as he glanced at the spot, "'Thank God he's not there!' Nightfall was approaching when he reached the latter village, but he made straight for the churchyard. On his entering it there remained light enough to discern the headstones by, and these he narrowly scanned. But though he searched the front part by the road and the back part by the river, what he sought he could not find, the grave of Sergeant Hallway, and a memorial bearing the inscription, I am not worthy to be called thy son. He left the churchyard and made inquiries. The honourable and reverend old rector was dead, and so were many of the choir, but by degrees the sergeant-major learnt that his father still lay at the crossroads in Long Ash Lane. 
luke pursued his way moodily homewards to do which in the natural course he would be compelled to repass the spot there being no other road between the two villages but he could not now go by that place vociferous with reproaches in his father's tones and he got over the hedge and wandered deviously through the ploughed fields to avoid the scene through many a fight and fatigue luke had been sustained by the thought that he was restoring the family honour and making noble amends yet his father lay still in degradation it was rather a sentiment than a fact that his father's body had been made to suffer for his own misdeeds but to his supersensitiveness it seemed that his efforts to retrieve his character and to propitiate the shade of the insulted one had ended in failure he endeavoured however to shake off his lethargy and not liking the associations of sidlinch hired a small cottage at chalk newton which had long been empty here he lived alone becoming quite a hermit and allowing no woman to enter the house the christmas after taking up his abode herein he was sitting in the chimney-corner by himself when he heard faint notes in the distance and soon a melody burst forth immediately outside his own window it came from the carol singers as usual and though many of the old hands ezra and lot included had gone to their rest the same old carols were still played out of the same old books there resounded through the sergeant-major's window-shutters the familiar lines that the deceased choir had rendered over his father's grave he comes the prisoners to release in satan's bondage held when they had finished they went on to another house leaving him to silence and loneliness as before the candle wanted snuffing but he did not snuff it and he sat on till it had burnt down into the socket and made waves of shadow on the ceiling the christmas cheerfulness of next morning was broken at breakfast time by tragic intelligence which went round the village like wind sergeant major hallway had been found shot through the head by his own hand at the cross-roads in long ash lane where his father lay buried on the table in the cottage he had left a piece of paper on which he had written his wish that he might be buried at the cross beside his father but the paper was accidentally swept to the floor and overlooked till after his funeral which took place in the ordinary way in the churchyard christmas eighteen ninety seven end of story four